Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Listen Up Hearing Centers, where we help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so they can remain connected with friends and family and remain independent. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is I lost my brother Robbie twice. First to the hearing loss from radiation to his brain tumor, and then when he passed away. I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor that only cares for ears. I'm the E of ENT. I've performed over 10,000 ear surgeries and taken care of many more with hearing loss. I'm the founder of Listen Up Hearing Centers, and I've also written a book of the same name, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com. That's listenuphearing.com. Today, we have a great guest, Cynthia Robinson. Uh, she has a long history in hearing loss and taking care of kids. She's a certified educator of deaf and listening and spoken language specialist with a master's of education from the University of Virginia. She's developed the mainstream assessment of readiness for children over five and co-authored the mainstream assessment for readiness preschools. So she's done a lot of work in that space with kids with hearing loss. Um, she's worked with kids with cochlear implants and has a background in working with children and families to develop listening and spoken language skills comparable to their hearing pairs. She worked as an instructor and then eventually became the co-director at the Clark School of Hearing and Speech. She worked there from 1998 to 2020, so she's a ton of experience. It's great she's here to, to share her perspective on hearing loss and children. Cynthia, thank, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for asking me. Oh, this is great. So t tell me how you ended up, I mean, you know, I know a little about it, we, we can explore that, but... Uh, how'd you end up being somebody who was an instructor and then eventually at the Clark School? But what drew you to that particular space, meaning children who were born with hearing impairment and by and large, most of them, I assume at your school, had cochlear implantation, some of them had hearing loss, but children who needed to develop their language skills. How did you get into that space in terms of your interest? In college, in my undergraduate days, I was an English and theater major. So a bit of a drama queen. I, I really enjoyed um, expressing myself through words, and I really enjoyed literature. So when I graduated from college, I started working as an editor for a small press. And it didn't take me long to figure out that uh, it was sort of a boring day-to-day -day <laughs> existence. So to sort of juice things up, I decided that in the evening, I would take a sign language course at a Catholic church near my house. So I went just for something to do, and I met lovely people there whose only language was sign, and they were obviously very intelligent. But because I was such a word person and such a language person, I kept thinking, gosh, their educational track and the careers they chose were so dictated by the fact that they didn't have access to spoken language. And I kept thinking, we need to do better. Sure. Uh, so that kind of haunted me. And then um, when the publishing company I was working for decided to relocate from Virginia to Georgia, I was not ready to relocate. So I decided to go to graduate school, and I decided to pursue a degree in education for deaf and hard of hearing. Well, so good thing they moved. <laughs> yeah. And then so you, you went from there, and then did you go right to the Clark School from there, or how did you get there? Oh, no. I've been doing this for a long time. So I was living in Richmond, Virginia. So I started out at um, a program in the public schools which actually, it was right after um, the federal law was passed that said you schools had to provide for, for children who had handicapping conditions. They couldn't be forced to go to boarding schools. Right. So um, I went into a classroom in the public school that had actually been founded um, in an Episcopal church basement and then got turned over to the public school system. And it was an oral program. And I sort of separate that from auditory because that was back in the day before cochlear implants and certainly before pediatric cochlear implants. So if a child um, had no access to sound that a hearing aid couldn't help correct, they were just 
profoundly deaf. So there wasn't as much listening going on, but we still developed spoken language, um, mostly tactily, visually. And I think the reason I value that first 20 years of my career so much is that because the path to listening and spoken language is not the same for every child. And I find that so many of the younger professionals were really educated in an age where cochlear implants had transformed everything. So they're very developmental, uh, expecting those children to follow very developmental pathways. So they don't have a lot of the remedial instructional skills that some children just need to give them that boost. So I really value that first 20 years. And then after um, cochlear implants, my first two students were private for me, and they taught me. Uh, Their names were John and Lizzie, and I really owe them a great debt of gratitude for helping me understand what was possible for a child who was born with a severe to profound hearing loss to accomplish in the hearing world. So for for the listeners, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the concept of the oral program was it was before we were actually able to give those uh, children access to sound. So even though they didn't have access to sound, you still worked with them to develop oral skills, meaning the ability to speak uh, as best they could. And because they couldn't hear themselves, you had to use other ways to give them feedback to get them to speak clearly and properly. Is that is that a fair assessment? Yes, that's a very good assessment. And we got um, a result that was what some people may say is typical deaf speech. So it was very implosive and guttural or very high-pitched and stretched from the uh, ten- uh, tension in the larynx because right. they didn't hear. Right. So we we speak the way we hear. Right. And so because they didn't have the feedback, meaning the detection of how their own voice sounded, it, it, it's, a, it's a much more challenging and frankly, much more labor intensive, meaning uh, the gains are a lot uh, more, take a lot more work to get a little less, to, to try to go the same distance would be a lot more work. And so cochlear implantation emerges and at that point, we can give these children access to sound and access to hear themselves. And then so then you're talking about that's where things kind of changed for you. You had these private students. And so John and Lacey, I think, where are they now? Do you know? Lacey, yeah. Yeah. Do you know where they are now? Uh, well, they both went on to graduate from very prestigious schools in um, Virginia. Right. And uh, they were a brother and sister. And um, they're all grown up. You know, living grown-up lives, uh, John is a stockbroker, and uh, Lucy has her own business. And that, so. so that's wonderful, right? And so they've actualized whatever they wanted to actualize, hopefully, for themselves. Right? Exactly. Right. And so, uh, obviously, there's a on right, more and more children are getting implanted, and uh, I suspect you got bigger and bu- busier and busier. Is that right? We did. And when I came to Clark in 1998, I was charged with designing the kindergarten program, uh, which I did. And then the following year, I was charged with designing the first grade program, which I did. So I assume you're following these students as they're going through. Yes. And then the next year, second grade, then the next year, third grade. And so I ended up with some of the older children in the program. At that time, we were not getting most children until they were four years old. So for the listeners, the point was they weren't detected to have a hearing loss that should be that could be implanted till that age. So now children are oftentimes implanted before their first birthday. And so those children who got implanted at third or three or four years had not had access to sound to develop normal to listening and spoken language skills. So they were behind relative to their peers, correct? Yes, that's correct. And also, um, I'm, you probably know there's a great shortage of um, professionals who are trained to develop listening and spoken language in children. And that's so even today. Correct. Um, yes. So a lot of times children who had been implanted early did not get the intervention that they needed. And so all of a sudden, here they are approaching uh, kindergarten age, 
and their parents are looking at them going, my child is totally not ready. I need to kick this up a notch. I need to find a place outside of my current community that can help my child. Right. And so as you were telling me, you developed the kindergarten, the first grade, the second grade. When did you develop the preschool? Because that's what was kind of well, popped in my mind. It's like, well, have- now we have preschool. So yeah, obviously- We did have a year of preschool, but that uh, that actually opened in 1997. So there was another teacher there at that time. Right. So I wasn't charged with that particular sure. task. But after a year of doing third grade, we were able to start working our way backwards, which is a sure sign of success. You know, a lot of people think, oh, you just keep adding and keep adding, and that's a sign of success. But as you well know, um, in the hearing loss community, being able to subtract self-contained intervention is the sign of success. So we kept subtracting Uh, and started adding from the bottom, which was really exciting. So uh, today, the program um, at Clark Schools uh, in Jacksonville, which is where I was, goes from birth to, um, by state legislation, seven years old. And most children leave before that. Right. So for the listeners, our goal now that we are, so there are a couple of things that impacted this. One is, is we have universal newborn screening meaning every newborn is supposed to, if they're hearing or not, if they're not, then they, hopefully they'll be captured by the system and then you know, given options of how to develop communication. And one of those, some of the families opt for cochlear implantation. And so our goal now is to get them up and running using the cochlear implant from a language, listening and spoken language point of view. And so what Cynthia is referring to is, is that they are have the skills to be able to mainstream. In other words, they're able to go with their peers, their hearing peers, and enter school. And it's amazing now because sometimes that's at kindergarten or first grade or second yes. grade. And and so I think what you were talking about when you first got into this field, you were trying to get them in at third or fourth grade to catch up. Right. right. That's correct. And now actually in my telepractice, I have children who are mainstreaming into typically hearing preschool. Yeah. So uh, because they got early intervention, they're able to catch up with their typically hearing peers and to learn incidentally, which is so very important. It's one thing to be able to coach a child and sort of force feed those listening and spoken language skills, but it's a very different skill set for that child to be at a level where they can be with hearing peers and learn incidentally from them in the classroom. Let alone the other topic, which is when you're so concentrated on learning, listening, and spoken language, you're missing out on those other things like socialization, relationships, interactions, how to get along with peers, all of those things that are also very important of preschool, kindergarten into early, well, actually, obviously continue into adulthood, but um, you know, uh, you're doing some of the foundational work of kind of peer relationships at that age. Yes, and that's one of the things that um, my co-author and I really focused on in the mainstream assessment of readiness for children preschool, is that tool we designed to look at the whole child, not just the listening and spoken language skills, but we wanted to look at the child's ability to interact socially, um, their, you know, emotional well-being, their environment. Uh, the support that they had from family and community, all just everything that we could think of that would really impact that child's ability to be successful. So that's really wonderful. And so interestingly, I mean, I think it's been everywhere. One of the restrictions has been um, geography. Like so in the Phoenix metropolitan area, there is a school and some of the kids would be I don't know, hour, hour and 15 minutes, even further away. And so as you and I are doing right now, I mean, one of the things that, uh, one of the fortunate outcomes of a very unfortunate pandemic has been uh, the ability for people to interact via Zoom. So that's what we're doing right now. And so I assume after you uh, finished, you would now, when you said you have a tele- telepractice, I think you said. So tell me a little bit about, so you, uh, 
I know in our warm up you said you're retired, but you really aren't retired. <laughs> um, so in your retirement, uh, you t- you were telling me what what have you been doing? So um, when I left Clark in uh, 2020, I knew I wasn't really finished because um, being with children and families in this it's field, addicting. It it is just it is I love it. Right. It's the I just feel so blessed that I had a career that I loved almost every single day that I went to work. So I decided to found We Hear Here, which is my organization for educating, supporting, referring, and providing services to children and families. So I do um, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I work with children all over the United States, so I don't have any restrictions and um, in that space. And I have worked with children internationally as well. So that's that's been a lot of fun. And I also support professionals just with advice and consults. So um, I try to help families relocate. I was was about to say. And you probably help parents a lot because a large part of this is obviously coaching and supporting parents through whatever advocacy or finding the services that they desire for their children. Yes. And the whole um, listening and spoken language model, the um, certification for listening and spoken language is a family coaching model. So we acknowledge that uh, family members, caretakers are the first teachers for that child. So... uh, Probably the biggest part of our job is what we do for parent education to help the families know what to do when we're not sitting there on the computer with them. Yeah, uh, for for the audience, the the research basically tells us that the largest determiner of uh, outcome for these children in terms of their listening and spoken language is uh, involvement of the mother. Um, by and large, right? And so, I mean, and I, I think they mean parent, but by and large, it has been the mother. And so, um, you know, what your Cynthia is referring to is is helping the parents teach the kids because it doesn't just end at school, right? In other words, when you're at home, you need to be highly verbal, and as much as uh, context with their peers at school helps them learn, at home, having a lot of language helps them learn as well. Correct. That's true. And I think it's also important to sort of link, um, well, particularly maternal, because they're usually the caretakers for the child. I think it's also important to link maternal mental health with the success of the child, because almost 95% of children who are born deaf or hard of hearing are born into hearing families right. that have no prior experience with deafness or the deaf community. And once they're educated about their options, about 85% of those families will choose listening and spoken language because that's the language of their they home. Yeah. But yeah, and, and because this was such an unexpected event in their lives, they, they may have trouble bonding there is sort of a grieving process sure. that comes no. along with this. Totally, 100%. So, yeah. So one of the things when I work with families from the very beginning, and I have a family right now that um, has a child who, baby, who's just two months old, and they're waiting for their hearing aids, which is going to happen on Wednesday. I'm so excited for them. But um, I don't, we, none of us are expecting to very much because I think this baby does have a profound loss, but um, it's a start and it's on our way to cochlear implants if that is what's medically needed. But um, that's a big shock for a family to have to go through. Yeah. And I know through my experience, even when the testing shows it and everything, you know, parents will later account to me, you know, yeah, we had our baby in the crib. So we went and got a pot and a pan and a spoon and we banged it. And so they're doing their own tests, right? To figure out that, you know, because they need to be convinced as well. Um, And so there is a process of coming through it and accepting it and getting to the point. And I'm sure hopefully you're coaching, but it sounds like you're coaching those families, at least one at this point. And that's that's really wonderful. Yeah, I I really enjoy that. And I really enjoy helping them feel positive about the journey that's ahead of them and connecting them with other families, which I think is really helpful. 
Yeah, it's a different journey than perhaps they had in their mind, but it's not, I mean, it's it's a wonderful journey. It is. Right. And so, I mean, obviously, you know, and that's wonderful that you uh, get to take them through. And then I assumed, are you doing online therapy as well with the children, working with the children online? Yes, I do. Um, I have a preschool student right now that uh, actually uh, she's a, a pre-kindergarten student. So her mother is incredibly good at this. So we're able to really work through a preschool curriculum together. And then I have um, two other children who are in typically hearing preschools. So I support them. They were they were my babies. Um, and but I continue to support them and um, help them make sure they're not forming any gaps out there uh, in the hearing world. Yeah, no, I know there are people in your position who are still, you know, sporadically coaching these kids into high school and college. Oh, uh, sure. Right, because it's I, just it's, I, it's the, the problem, the challenge, the medical problem is the same. The context is so different, right? In other words, what's expected of you in high school. And then what is expected of you in college? And then self-advocacy becomes so important. Yes. And I do have uh, four students right now in a school district that I contract with all the way from fifth grade up through 11th grade. So I consult with those teachers and just problem solve if anything comes up. And what what role do you see telehealth? I mean, you know, what I was referring to in in the in my metropolitan area that the travel distances were so far and for many very onerous. And so you're projecting your expertise across the United States or are some of them in, in areas where there is no services, you're delivering services to places where they don't have access? Yes. And That's if wonderful. family is um and of course I live in Florida, Florida is a very big state. <laughs> so uh um, most of the families I work with, the majority are in Florida, but we only have two listening and spoken language schools right. in the entire state, one in the South and one in the North. So that leaves a lot of space that is underserved. So it's a, it's an easy start for me. Well, but I on- think it'd be overcoming, I mean, there were people who moved. I mean, they would move Absolutely. to be near these schools, and and I, I admire that, but that is very disruptive because even if you move for the services, you might be leaving the grandparents and the uncles and the aunts and the cousins and all of that other support. So being able to come to some sort of uh, delivery of services without people having to relocate is wonderful. Yes, and that is one of the first things I discuss with families. What is your ability to relocate? Because after my long history in schools, and I love school, period. Uh, right. It's my favorite place to be. I do think that children very much benefit from being in a school. So um, if if there's any way that a family can relocate in Florida, either to the north or to the south, um, I encourage them to do that. And as far as other families, I have um, I've gotten families into the Atlanta Speech and Hearing School into the Moog School out in St. Louis, um, into Sunshine Cottage. Just, you know, I if there's any way that a family can make this work for their family, sure. then I think a move is is a is a good bet for them. If they have that ability, yes. If they have that ability. Yeah. Yes. So this has been wonderful. Um tell me a little bit about how people so uh if they wanted to get a hold of you, how would they do that, Cynthia? Your, your organization is uh, called We Hear Here, so I assume it's H-E-A-R-H-E-R-E. Right? That's right. So they can look at my website, which is wehearhere.org, O-R-G. Uh, they can email me at crobinson at wehearhere.org. And uh, my phone number is easily available uh, on my website, so... Um, happy to happy to hear from people who have questions. Oh, that's wonderful, Cynthia. What, what's your favorite sound? I will say that, and it's kind of a funny thing, but I will. My children, my own personal children, are all grown up and have their own lives. Um, so I have two cocker spaniels that I am very devoted to. So. One of my favorite sounds is the sound of rain, 
because mm-hmm. often here in Florida, when you get a good rain, you also get thunder. So when I hear that heavy rainfall, it's such a cozy feeling. And then if there's a bit of thunder, particularly one of my cocker spaniels is very worried about that. So I get good cuddle time. (laughs) That's wonderful. That is wonderful. So again, everybody, this is Cynthia Robinson. Um, She has extensive experience in uh, listening and spoken language for children who are hearing impaired. And uh, she has a new organization that she's running called WeHearHear.org. It's W-E-H-E-A-R-H-E-R-E.org. Um, reach out if you have any questions. Cynthia, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate you sharing your uh, experience and knowledge in this field and your passion about helping these children and families. Oh, well, thank you for asking me. I enjoyed it a lot. Thanks for coming on. This has been great. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.